Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Okay, um, so uh, we'll move on uh, to the next talk uh, today, uh, which continues with our cardiovascular theme. And up for that, we have Dr. Greg Meller, who is a consultant cardiologist at Royal Patworth Hospital in Cambridge. He's, uh, he has a special interest in uh, cardiac electrophysiology, um, and he'll be telling us a bit about some important uh, features to look for in ECGs and in patients who may be at risk of sudden cardiac death. So, Dr. Meller, over to you if you would share your slides with us now, please. Well, thank you, Franz. Hopefully you can see the slides now. So, um, as Fred mentioned, my name is Greg Mayer. I'm a consultant at Patworth Hospital in Cambridge. And we're going to talk this, this evening for you, this afternoon for me, um, about some of the diagnostic ECG features associated with conditions where there is a risk of sudden cardiac death. So, unfortunately, sudden cardiac death is very common. Um, this is 20-year-old data, but it almost certainly remains true that 50% of cardiac deaths are sudden in nature, and sudden cardiac death probably is responsible for around 10% of all deaths. And the end mechanism of sudden cardiac death, for the most part, is ventricular fibrillation. This is a 12-lead ECG that you should never see. Uh, the doctor should have been more preparing the... the uh, DFib pads and the 12 lead, but either way. Uh, this is the endpoint ventricular fibrillation. We're going to focus this evening on arrhythmic cardiac death, most of which is due to ischemic heart disease. So either the acute consequence of plaque rupture and a complete occlusion of an epicardial coronary vessel, or the long term consequence of a previous myocardial infarction. And this MRI scan shows a well-established scar here in the lateral LV wall, which can be responsible for ventricular tachycardia months or even years after the original event. However, around one in eight sudden cardiac arrest survivors are found to have normal coronary arteries with an alternative explanation. And in those cases, we're talking about either the primary cardiac arrhythmia syndromes so these are the iron channel disease or ch channelopathies, most commonly long QT and Brugada syndromes. Also, particularly in younger paediatric groups, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And in patients with pre-excitation who also have atrial fibrillation. And then the second group are the heart muscle disease, the cardiomyopathies, which are associated with a risk of sudden cardiac death. So most commonly that's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, followed by arrhythmogenic, uh, or used to be called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, dilated cardiomyopathy, and finally, as already mentioned, ischemic cardiomyopathy. So what I'd like to do now is just run through a series of cases uh, of a number of these conditions, focusing really on the ECG diagnostic features, um, but then also with some background on the conditions themselves. So this is our first case. This was a 28-year-old male professional footballer who collapsed on the pitch. He had been complaining of chest pains in training sessions in the lead-up to the game. And it was noted that his father had died suddenly and unexpectedly in his 40s. Thankfully, he recovered consciousness and was admitted to the emergency department. And physical examination was unremarkable apart from the finding of a systolic murmur. And this, as I said, is his 12-lead ECG. So I'll just talk you through this. So what we see here is sinus rhythm. The most striking abnormalities is, are the large QRS voltages, so particularly seen in the septal leads V2 and V3, but also in the lateral leads with V5 here in excess of 80 millimetres. Associated with this is lateral ST segment depression and T wave inversion with deep peaked negative T waves. So this is a marker of left ventricular hypertrophy, often with this associated strain pattern. Of note, the patient also has evidence of atrial disease. The P waves are of high amplitude in the inferior leads, suggestive of right atrial enlargement. And there's a biphasic positive negative P wave in lead V1, which is diagnostic of left atrial enlargement. So 
So we can say from this ECG, this patient has significant left ventricular hypertrophy with biatrial dilatation. And this is diagnostic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic disease. It's caused by mutations in the genes associated with the sarcomere. This is the structure responsible for contraction and relaxation of the cardiomyocytes. Um, the end result is this massive hypertrophy you see uh, within predominantly the left ventricle. So this is a pathological section, cross section through the left ventricle. Um, this is the aortic valve here, the left ventricular outflow tract, which is obstructed by a combination of the thickened septum and the mitral valve leaflets here. And then this is the rest of the mitral valve and the left atrium. As in our case, unfortunately, this has been the res responsible for the sudden death of several professional sportsmen, including these two uh, footballers. You may recognise Mark Vivian Foe, who died during an international match playing for Cameroon, uh, and Miklos Ferrer, who died playing for Benfica in the early 2000s. The three features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are the manifest left ventricular hypertrophy with associated myocardial disarray on histology. So rather than nicely lined up straight lines of cardiomyocytes, you can see these are all pointing in different directions, which is responsible for the underlying conduction de delay and associated re-entrant ventricular tachycardia. Uh, on top of that, the, these patients develop small vessel disease um, and ischemia, particularly within these very thickened areas. So again, this is the left ventricular septum. And you can see, hopefully, little patches of scar tissue caused by hypoxia from this small vessel disease within the septum. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, a common disease. It affects about one in 500 individuals and uh, is a leading cause for sudden cardiac death in young to middle-aged adults. Not all patients with HCM are at risk of sudden cardiac death, um, and there are several known risk factors. A family history of sudden death due to HCM, the presence of previous syncope or non-sustained VT on a Holter monitor are all markers of sudden death, as is, as is increasing septal width and left atrial enlargement. Within Europe, all of these factors are entered into a, a, a calculating algorithm that will give you a predicted risk of sudden death over the following five years, which will allow the decision about ICD implant, implantation. Uh, obviously, the diagnostic modality, in, in addition to ECG, is echocardiography. And this is uh, images from uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Williams, at Royal Papworth Hospital. This first image is a parasternal long axis view. So again, now we have the hypertrophied interventricular septum here with the left ventricular outflow tract and then the aortic valve here with the mitral valve and a dilated left atrium uh, posteriorly. And then in a short axis view, this is now cutting through the left ventricle at the, le ed at the le level sorry, of the mitral valve. So again, hopefully you can see, if my cursor works, you can see uh, concentric LVH predominantly affecting the septum rather than the lateral wall. Okay, so moving on to the second case, and I'm purposefully uh, jumping around from condition to condition here. So this is a 25-year-old uh, female. She was working in a, a shop when she developed sudden onset rapid palpitations uh, and felt dizzy. She didn't pass out but was brought to the emergency department uh, in early cardiogenic shock with a rapid pulse and low blood pressure. It turned out she'd had a previous episode of syncope during school sports as a child, which had been put down to heat stroke. This ECG, I hope you agree, shows a broad, complex tachycardia, but notably it is irregularly irregular in its rhythm and the QRS morphology is variable from beat to beat. So looking closely through, each QRS complex is different to the one before and after and with no real pattern. And the rate is, is very fast, but it's irregular with shortest RR intervals way above 200 beats per minute. So the patient was cardioverted. This is a, not her, but an, an example of a sinus rhythm ECG that hopefully demonstrates what the diagnosis is. 
This is ventricular pre-excitation, and this previous ECG is pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So an irregularly irregular broad complex rhythm with changing QRS morphologies can only be pre-excited atrial fibrillation. So Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is uh, caused by the presence of an accessory pathway between the atria and ventricles, and it results in this diagnostic ECG pattern of a short PR interval of less than 120 milliseconds. And you can see in this example, there's an absence of an isoelectric portion of the PR interval and a slurred onset to the QRS, which we call a delta wave. And this is caused because of this additional accessory connection between the atrium and ventricles, so that in sinus rhythm, signals are simultaneously conducted over the AV node and through the Hispokinji system, but also over the accessory pathway, causing this area of the ventricular myocardium to be activated early. The conduction here is myocyte to myocyte and therefore is slow compared to within the Hispokinji system, so that the normal conduction catches up, as it were, meaning that the second portion of the QRS complex is relatively normal. In the context of pre-excited atrial fibrillation, the main management step is not to give any AV nodal blocking drugs. Any medication or procedure that causes blockage of the AV node will preferentially lead to conduction over the accessory pathway. The accessory pathway does not exhibit the same protective decremental conduction properties as the AV node, and therefore can transmit the atrial fibrillation very rapidly into the ventricle causing ventricular fibrillation. So in the acute setting, DC cardioversion is safer than any antiarrhythmic drug, all of which may also block the AV node. And then once the patient is stabilised, the uh, class one treatment is catheter ablation to uh, destroy this accessory pathway. Uh, case number three, this is a, an 18 year old lady. She was working as an outdoor activities instructor. She's from the UK, but was working in France, taking a group of school children uh, around the Alps. And on this particular day, she was teaching them how to canoe uh, and specifically how to write the canoe after you tipped into the water. So uh, for anybody who does canoeing, you'll know that to do this activity, you roll yourself into the water and then uh, right the canoe back upright. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, this young lady went under the water, she didn't return and had to be dragged out by her colleagues, um, thankfully came to on the side of the river. Um, and it turned out that she'd had several other loss of consciousness episodes while swimming as a teenager. So this is her ECG again, it's sinus rhythm, uh, relatively bradycardic. And you'll notice that the T waves are of low amplitude with a fairly broad base, and they're inverted here in lead one with this late terminal negative deflection and also in AVL. When you measure the QT interval on this ECG, the correct QT interval is 490 milliseconds. The combination of a prolonged QT interval and the, the syncope on swimming led to a clinical suspicion of long QT syndrome. She went on to have genetic testing and had this missense variant identified in the gene KCNQ1, which is diagnostic of long QT syndrome type 1. So long QT syndrome is the most common of the iron channel diseases. It affects probably about 1 in 2,000, uh, at least within uh, European populations, and it's caused by genetic loss of function mutations in the potassium channels responsible for the repolarizing current of the uh, action potential, or less commonly, gain of function mutations in the sodium channel current leading to an overactivation of the initial part of the action potential. It causes a delay to the repolarization in the cardiomyocytes, which manifests as a prolongation of the QT interval on the ECG, and it causes sudden death by an increased risk of this very particular ventricular arrhythmia called torsade de point. There's large variation in the QT uh, measurements in the normal population and in the disease population, and we'll come on to that shortly. Uh, 
often the biggest challenge in diagnosing long QT syndrome is actually accurate measurements of the QT tool on the 12 lead ECG. Uh, we'll go through that shortly. In, in the bottom corner here is uh, Professor Andrew Cran, a, a former mentor of mine, who has a very excellent, if not a little bit long, uh, YouTube video on just how to do this. But uh, for those of you who don't quite have enough time, uh, I will give you the short version. So the QT interval starts with the activation of the QRS complex. That's normally fairly easy to identify. Um, first, you identify the isoelectric line, commonly through the PR interval. But if this is uh, depressed, which it can sometimes be, from the end of the T wave to the following P wave, then the onset of the QRS, as I said, is normally quite straightforward. It's the first deflection, so in this case, a small Q wave. And then the trick is identifying the end of the T wave. This is a fairly straightforward example, but um, there are others where the T wave morphology makes it more challenging. What we recommend is picking the maximum descent of the downward slope of the T wave, drawing a tangent through this point, and the point at which it intersects your isoelectric line uh, is the end of the T wave. So you'll note that you do ignore these tiny little shoulders or potential second uh, U-wave phenomena that follow the T-wave. And so that is your absolute QT interval. The second challenge then is to correct for the uh, baseline heart rate at the time of the measurement. So as you know, your QT interval will shorten as your heart rate increases. This is a normal physiological response to allow the action potential to reset more quickly, allowing more rapid depolarizations. And there are a number of uh, often very well-known formula for correcting uh, the QT4 heart rate. The most commonly used is, is Bazit's formula. So this is the QT divided by the square root of the preceding R to R interval. Uh, Friedericke's formula is very similar, but it's the cube root of the previous RR interval. But what this graph shows is that if you choose a correct acute interval, very normal, uh, in this example, 420 milliseconds, you'll see that these formulae will give you a very different absolute QT interval over a wide range of heart rates. So while they are useful, they're most useful when clustered around a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. Uh, in very bradycardic or tachycardic patients, the correction uh, is less accurate leading to over, either an overestimate or underestimate of the true QT interval. So once you've actually measured your patient's QT interval, what you need to know is whether that's uh, long or too long. Um, I've always, always used to show this photograph of Alex Ferguson. He's a former manager of Manchester United and was renowned for, for pressurising the referee to add in extra time at the end of a game, which was called Fergie time. Um, perhaps now he's retired and uh, this chap's come along. This season, Liverpool were renowned for scoring late goals, so Fergie time has now been replaced by uh, Cloppage time. But back to QTs. Uh, as mentioned before, there is a wide range in the uh, what is considered normal for a QT interval, both in the general population demonstrated by these two curves here, uh, for males in the uninterrupted black line and females in the dotted line and in those with uh, genetically confirmed long QT syndrome. Uh, and you'll notice that there's a large overlap zone here where patients who are either within the normal population or long QT population may sit. Accepted uh, normal upper limits are is 450 seconds for a male or 460 milliseconds for a female but it must be noted that simply falling slightly out of this range is not sufficient for a diagnosis of long QT syndrome and other things must be taken into account such as the patient's clinical presentation, changes on QT with exercise and family and genetic background as well. And of course in some cases it's much more uh, obvious, this is another patient who presented, in fact, with a cardiac arrest and was went on to be confirmed with long QT type 2. You'll see in this ECG that the QT interval is massively prolonged, measuring around 800 milliseconds with very bizarre looking T waves uh, and also shows a phenomenon uh, best seen in these three beats of T wave alternands, 
where you have uh, alternating high and low amplitude T waves. And this is a, a very high risk marker for impending uh, arrhythmia. In general, the risk of arrhythmic events or syncope is low in most patients with long QT syndrome and is related both to their absolute QT prolongation and their underlying uh, genotype. So we won't go into the genetics in too much detail, but suffice to say there are three subtypes of long QT denoted by the underlying genetic mutation, with one being most common, three being least common but highest risk. So moving from one to two to three increases your risk, as does an increase in your uh, QT interval. In general, QTs under 500 milliseconds, particularly long QT type one, uh, have a low risk. Um, and QTs over 500 is when the risk really starts to increase. In all cases, beta blockers, particularly the non-selective beta blockers, nadlol and propranolol, will reduce this risk and are recommended for all patients, um, apart from those who really definitely can't tolerate them the num numbers of which are actually relatively rare. Uh, this, coming back to our original patient, this is, uh, she had, so she was put on beta blockers and had a loop recorder fitted. This is a diagnostic device uh, that automatically records any arrhythmias. She went back to France and we had this transmission several months later. Um, so to orientate you, this is a single channel recording that starts here and runs consecutively through. So you'll sh see here, this is sinus rhythm. There is a ventricular ectopic here, and then a second one initiating torsade de point ventricular tachycardia. And the device is to save battery, uh, automatically suspend e ECG recording um, when they have a sustained arrhythmia. So this was suspended for a further 48 seconds. And then when the device woke up again, patient was still in VT. Um, and then miraculously perhaps, reverted back to sinus rhythm. It transpired that she had forgotten to take her medication uh, and gone swimming with a friend. And, and during this minute and 12 seconds of uh, VT was being dragged out of the pool. And again, thankfully, made a complete recovery. It's known that swimming is a particularly high risk in long QT1, and that's due to a combination of further QT prolongation at higher heart rates with uh, the altered autonomic balance that's associated with breath holding under, and, and being underwater uh, and a subsequent increase in ventricular ectopy. So for those people who are dealing with long QT patients, counselling around exercise and swimming is particularly important. On to the next case. <clears throat> um, so this again is a, a young patient, 21-year-old chap who was uh, resuscitated from a cardiac arrest. He'd been out to celebrate uh, with a, a group of friends. He'd had a few drinks, he'd had a large meal and promptly collapsed uh, on the dining table. Um, and this was his ECG when he was brought into the emergency department after being uh, resuscitated. So again, you'll see that it shows sinus rhythm. And the most striking abnormality in this case is the very bizarre looking QRS complex, particularly seen here in V1 and V2. He has conduction delay with an RSR pattern or partial right bundle branch block pattern associated with a very odd looking ST segment elevation and a negative T wave. And I can tell you that this chap had normal coronary arteries um, and this ECG is diagnostic, diagnostic of Brugada syndrome. Uh, so Brugada syndrome is another iron channel disease. It was first reported in 1992 by two cardiologists, Pedro and Josep Brugada from just outside Barcelona in Spain. And they presented a case series of young men dying frequently in their sleep or being resuscitated from cardiac arrest in their sleep and having this unusual ECG pattern, which has since been coined the type one Brugada ECG pattern diagnostic of this condition. So the type one pattern consists of a combination of an RSR pattern, particularly in the right ventricular leads, V1 and V2, followed by two millimetres or more of J-point elevation. So the J-point is uh, the point be between the end of the QRS complex and the following ST segment, and then coved or triangular-like ST seg segment elevation and subsequent T-wave inversion. <clears throat> 
And this is another example uh, showing the type 1 ECG pattern in lead V1 and, and an associated similar but non-diagnostic pattern in V2. Uh, this is just to, to note that there are descriptions of type 2 and type 3 Brugada ECG patterns which are suspicious of the condition but not diagnostic. And these are found probably in about 1 in 200 uh, healthy individuals. And so do, it, it should be noted that if patients are not presenting with syncope, not to make a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome based just on a type 2 pattern, although it may warrant further investigation. Uh, further notes on the ECG. It, it's known that in Brugada syndrome, the underlying electrophysiological abnormalities are in the right ventricular outflow tract, hence seeing the ECG abnormalities in V1 and V2. Um, however, it, the RVOT sometimes sits quite high in, in a patient's chest, and so the standard ECG positions in the fourth intercostal space, V1 and V2, may miss the RVOT um, because it's sitting higher up. And therefore, we recommend, in addition, doing ECGs with V1 and V2 displaced into the second intercostal space in addition. Uh, this can be done very simply by moving your V3 and V4 electrodes uh, into the second intercostal space, so essentially to stack them up above your V1 and V2. And this is an example uh, of a patient where in their standard right ventricular precordial leads, there's a slightly unusual but non-diagnostic ST segment. But with the lead higher up, you can see a classical uh, coved ST elevation diagnostic of Brugada syndrome. The further complicating issue around Brugada syndrome is that the ECG phenotype or the ECG manifestations can be highly variable. Uh, these are two recordings taken from a, a single 24-hour halter monitor um, with the ECG's position in V1 and V2, but also in the second intercostal space again. And you can see that at 1.30 p.m. this patient has a type 1 pattern seen throughout all ECG leads, whereas uh, later on in the evening, the ECG is less prominent with the standard ECGs being non-diagnostic and mainly maybe a borderline pattern in V1. So uh, a single non-diagnostic ECG unfortunately cannot exclude Brugada syndrome, particularly in a patient where you think there is a high risk, either because of a clinical event or because of a family history of Brugada syndrome. And so um, to get around this variability, uh, a diagnostic test called a sodium channel blocker provocation was developed. This involves giving intravenous sodium channel blocker. We use Ashmaline in the UK. Other places around the world would use flecainide or procainamide. And the idea is that if, if patients with Brugada syndrome and a non-diagnostic ECG are challenged with this sodium channel blocker, they will develop the diagnostic ECG pattern. Uh, this is an example from our clinic. So again, this ECG uh, is orientated with V1 and V2, and then the V3 and V4 electrodes are positioned in the high, so second intercostal space. So this is V1 and V2. And then after administration of the Ashmaline, uh, hopefully you can see here that the ECG is remarkably different, and we now have a diagnostic Brugada pattern seen in the standard and in the high RV lead positions. Uh, this ECG was taken from the first degree relative of the uh, index case with the cardiac arrest. The risk of cardiac arrest in patients with Brugada syndrome, again, is very variable, similar to in long QT syndrome, although we don't have quite good such models for those who are high risk in Brugada syndrome, and we don't have any good medical therapy. The only real intervention available is either uh, an implantable defibrillator or in very extreme cases a catheter ablation of the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, this graph is, is here to show how different the rates of uh, or sudden cardiac death can be. This is taken from a population of Europeans with a, uh, an average age of 45 and these red lines are the rates of sudden cardiac death compared to the average uh, rate of death for, from all causes in the UK group by age. So you can see that if you have a, 
a drug-induced ECG but no symptoms, your risk of death goes from being a 45-year-old to a 55-year-old, nothing that we would be particularly concerned about. If you have an abnormal ECG but no symptoms, then you have the same risk of death as someone in their late 60s. But if you've had syncope or a cardiac arrest with either a drug-induced or a spontaneous ECG, all of a sudden you're at the same risk of dying as a, a individual in their 80s or even older and when you're 45 that's a, a relatively big uh, increase um, and so those patients will almost automatically be offered an ICD. So that can also be shown in this simple two by two chart. Uh, patients with a, a, an abnormal ECG and syncope should be offered an ICD as should those patients with arrhythmic syncope and a positive sodium channel blocker test. Conversely, those patients who have no symptoms and simply have a, a drug-induced ECG pattern have been shown to be at low risk and do not require an ICD. Um, and the group in the middle, so the abnormal ECG but no symptoms, uh, are those patients where we unfortunately scratch our heads somewhat and maybe consider further assessment, which may be with invasive EP studies or additional monitoring. In terms of long-term follow-up, it's quite clear when people transition from the asymptomatic to symptomatic stage. But what's not known is how often patients fluctuate from having an abnormal resting ECG to uh, having a normal ECG. And this can be a challenge for a long-term follow-up of Brugada patients. Okay, so moving on now to the next case. So... This was a 28-year-old man. He was a, a regular uh, athlete, often running marathons. He became unwell early on during a, a, a short five-kilometer race. Uh, he didn't collapse, but he reported to the uh, race officials feeling very unwell. A paramedic found him to be in this broad complex tachycardia with a heart rate of 200 beats per minute and a relatively low blood pressure. And so this, as I said, shows a broad complex tachycardia um, and this this is ventricular tachycardia I won't go through in too much detail but you can see little notches every so often on the QRS and these are independent P waves uh, showing there is dissociation between the atrium and ventricles with more ventricular beats than there are atrial beats uh, meaning this can only be VT uh, for those ECG aficionados in the audience, this is a left bundle branch type morphology suggesting it's coming from the right ventricle and it has a positive axis in the inferior lead suggesting it's coming from relatively high up, perhaps in the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, he was cardioverted and this was his sinus rhythm ECG uh, during his admission, so not immediately afterwards but several hours later. Uh, and now you can see sinus rhythm, so P wave followed by QRS. Uh, and again, looking at the precordial leads, uh, there is a slightly unusual QRS complex with some fragmentation within it in V1, followed by inverted T waves that extend from V1 right out to V4, V5, and some ST depression in V6. He also had normal coronary arteries, um, and this gentleman has arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy as diagnosed on his MRI scan. So um, these are cross-sections from a, uh, an MRI in long and short axis. So in these top two images, you can see the interventricular septum here. The left ventricle is inferiorly here with the, uh, the mitral valve. And then this is the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve would sit across here. And these are in, in, cyst, in diastole and then in systole. So the, the first striking thing is the right ventricle is very large, would normally be smaller than the left ventricle, but in this case is, is uh, very much bigger. And during systole, you see the, this crenulation or irregularity in the outside wall of the RV and this outpouch, outpouching or relatively dyskinesia. Um, similarly again here in the short axis view so this is the left ventricle here interventricular septum and the right ventricle which wraps around the left ventricle again extremely enlarged and then these abnormal outpouchings in the, the lateral wall which is diagnostic of uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy previously called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia because it does predominantly affect the right ventricle as in this case 
although uh, similar findings can be found in the left ventricle as well. So uh, ARVC is caused by underlying problems in the cardiac desmosome. This is the structure that uh, attaches cardiomyocytes to one another and genetic mutations in these various proteins such as placophyllin uh, and desmocolin causes this uh, desmosome to fail and the cardiomyocytes are stretched apart. The gap in between is filled with fat and fibrosis um, and leads to structural weakening, but also an impairment of the electrical conduction through the ventricle, allowing these re-entrant uh, ventricular arrhythmias to occur. Um, other ECG features uh, not present in our case uh, are it, more gross manifestations of the conduction delay. So the pathonomic feature is this thing called an epsilon wave. So this is a, a blown up version of a V1, with an inverted P wave here. This is a QRS complex with an RSR pattern. And then after the QRS, a second discrete high frequency depolarization, which is an epsilon wave. And it can also be detected by the signal average ECG, where you see a late and high frequency spike here. And this is a manifestation of that delayed conduction through the right ventricle. Uh, the formal diagnosis of ARVC can be complex. It takes into account ECG and imaging findings, as well as symptoms and uh, genetic and family background as well. The treatment of ARVC involves an anti arrhythmic medication, uh, ICD implants, uh, but particularly the, the restriction of, of individuals from participating in uh, competitive sports because that's known to uh, exacerbate the condition. So that's covered a number of these uh, conditions. I didn't go through CPVT or, or dilated cardiomyopathy because they don't really have diagnostic features, at least on the resting ECG. What I'd like to just do to finish off is to quickly go through bradyarrhythmias. So obviously these are, are not causes of sudden cardiac death through ventricular fibrillation, but patients can get asystolic cardiac arrests. Uh, and they're much more commonly seen in the emergency department. So this is an example of complete heart block. So what we see here is a regular and slow ventricular rhythm, which is completely dissociated from the underlying atrial rhythm. So you have P waves that march through at a slightly irregular rate and have no connection to the QRS complexes. In this particular case, the QRS complexes are narrow, suggesting that the escape beat is coming from within the Hispokinji system, uh, and it's not so slow that, that the patient would require a temporary pacing wire. So in this case, it's a fairly low risk, complete heart block. But even in these patients left untreated, obviously, there is a risk of uh, asystole and sudden death, and they, they should have a, a pacemaker implanted. Similarly, this is a two to one AV block. So you can see here, highlighted by the stars, you have a non-conducted P wave in between each conducted P wave. So on the rhythm strip here, you have P, QRS, there's a second P in the end of the T wave here, which is not conducted. And then the, the subsequent P wave is conducted and that pattern repeats through. So again, these patients have a, a high risk of progressing to complete heart block and therefore asystolic arrest and should also get a pacemaker in almost all circumstances. Uh, less worrying complete heart block involves type 1 AV block, which is just a prolonged PR interval. So in this case, a PR interval of around 400 milliseconds. Or this, which is uh, Wenke back. So here you see a non-conducted P wave followed by a PR interval that is relatively normal and then subsequently prolongs over several beats before being blocked again and the subsequent P wave being conducted with a relatively normal PR that then begins to prolong once again. So this cycle of progressive PR prolongation followed by a drop P wave uh, is called Mobitz type 1 AV block or Wenke back. This can be physiological. 
uh, particularly in young healthy individuals and is not a class one indication for pacing. However, in patients who have syncope uh, and particularly have this pathway wanky back during waking hours and when they're ambulant may also require pacemaker, although the risk of sudden death is extremely low in these patients. And then finally, uh, an example of uh, a sinus rhythm ECG that carries a high risk of complete heart block. So this uh, shows sinus rhythm. There's a combination of first degree AV block with a mildly prolonged PR interval. There is left anterior hemi block, manifests as left axis deviation, and right bundle branch block seen here in lead V1. So this combination of first degree heart block, left anterior hemi block, and right bundle branch block is referred to as trifascicular block. Particularly important to note in patients who have presented with syncope because it can progress to complete heart block, uh, which is in fact demonstrated on this ECG. So you'll see at the end of the recording, the final P wave, which appears uh, to come in slightly early, is not conducted. And then the patient has a ventricular paste beat. This ECG was recorded on the coronary care unit on, on a patient who presented with syncope and had a temporary pacing wire uh, implanted just minutes before this ECG. So thank you very much for your attention. That was a kind of whistle-stop tour through uh, some of the conditions that can cause sudden cardiac arrest, and I'd be ha happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Greg. That was fantastic uh, as an overview for some uh, really interesting ECGs and presentations that I'm sure we all see uh, albeit infrequently sometimes, but important ones not to miss. Can I perhaps start by asking you, Greg, about a very common occurrence we see on, on the ward? So I did a ward round earlier today, and on it was a man, young man, who was walking his dog and felt a bit funny and then collapsed to the floor. Um, was unrousable for a few seconds, but is now in hospital. ECG looks normal. His blood tests are normal. His monitoring overnight is normal. I probably end up getting an echo, an outpatient ECG, a 24-hour monitor, which is completely useless, mostly, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, often it just says it's normal. Would I be better referring these people up for an ILR or just saying, well, actually, it's probably just a faint. Don't worry. Go home and don't worry about it sort of thing. So uh, probably the second option I'll say for us, the... Um so in terms of assessing syncope, it's worth noting that 40% of people will have at least one syncopal episode during their lifetime. And the vast majority of these are vasovagal uh, in uh, etiology. Normally, vasovagal syncope is, is fairly easy to identify from the history. So if patients uh, have a stereotypical trigger, either they've just stood up or they've been stood up for, for some time, they have a typical prodrome and recovery that all sounds like vasovagal syncope, then uh, the etiology is likely to be that. And if you look at the long-term survival of patients with syncope of that description, it's the same as people who've never had syncope. Um, so the important thing is to, to note those people with arrhythmic syncope, so uh, patients who have little or no prodrome, who are um, exercising when they have their syncope or who have abnormal resting ECGs. And those patients probably require further evaluation. Um, a, a syncope or a TLOC clinic, uh, as uh, you have at Adenbrooks, is a good way to integrate cardiology and neurology to get the relative investigations. Um, in terms of ILR, so loop, in terms of implantable loop recorders, I would reserve that for somebody who had uh, either two syncopal events which were, had some borderline features or where you were suspicious of a particular um, diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Dr. Borokar, do you uh, want to yeah. take the next question? Yeah. We've got some good questions come up uh, and this is a question from Amit. Uh, what he wants to know is uh, we have some of the genetically uh, induced uh, left ventricular hypertrophy how do you distinguish that between uh, HCM and LVH and a simple LVH apart from the presentation age? Are there any other ways to distinguish between them? So uh, it's a, a, an excellent question and, and can be a real challenge. So the common scenario is uh, a, a patient with high 
blood pressure, maybe a little bit older, who presents with left ventricular hypertrophy. And the question is whether it's hypertension or hypertensive heart disease versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There isn't a, an easy way to, to know for certain. I think the important things to think about with those sorts of patients is, is there a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or other people, members of the family who've died suddenly where you may be concerned about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Um, it, is there truly a, a history of untreated hypertension to a degree that would be uh, causative of the, of the LVH? And then uh, so some MRI features can also be helpful. Uh, the presence of late gadolinium indicating scar is much more common in genetically mediated or sarcomeric HCM than it is in hypertensive heart disease. But there are definitely some patients where, where you can't really tell um, and certainly we have a number of those under long-term surveillance in our clinic. Uh, are, okay. there some, are there any ECG markers for cholinergic, catecholaminergic uh, uh, polymorphic VTAC? Can we diagnose that in the resting condition because that's another uh, area where you could get a uh, sudden cardiac death? Yeah, so, um, so for CPVT, the resting ECG will be absolutely normal. So um, there are no diagnostic markers on the resting ECG. However, it is worth noting that if you have particularly a young patient who has presented with true arrhythmic syncope on exercise, CPVT should always be considered. It's a rare di disease, probably at one in 10,000, but it has a very high mortality rate. The way of diagnosing CPVT is with an exercise test or an adrenaline provocation test, but pre preferably an exercise test. And what you're looking for is the induction of bidirectional VT on an exercise test. So that's the classic uh, diagnostic finding. However, what you do often find rather than the classic bidirectional VT is just an increasing number, uh, an increasing complexity of PVCs or ventricular ectopics as a patient exercises. Fred? Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, you touched upon um, QT prolongation. Could you talk a bit about drugs that cause QT prolongation? Of course, uh, there's been a question specifically about the dangers of hydroxychloroquine uh, causing QT prolongation. So just perhaps a quick few words on, on drugs that might do that. Sure. So um, it's certainly recognised that many drugs can cause QT prolongation. Um, the... And, and often those individuals who have drug-induced long QT syndrome will have some form of genetic susceptibility underlying that. There is a very good reference website uh, which patients can, uh, can visit. There's also an associated smartphone app. It's called Credible Meds, so C-R-E-D-I-B-L-E meds.org. Um, and that is uh, run by a very reputable group and uh, updated regularly. And th that has a good reference list for which drugs should be avoided in patients with long QT syndrome. Uh, in terms of hydroxychloroquine, that is on that list. Um, and even before COVID, it was recognised that hydroxychloroquine could prolong the QT interval. Uh, and obviously, there was a lot of media attention around, uh, around this. Actually, there haven't been many cases of hydroxychloroquine inducing torsi de point. And that was the message from the uh, rheumatologists who were using this drug regularly beforehand. The... Probably in terms of COVID, the concern was a uh, combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, which was used early oh. on. Of course, now the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine for COVID has been effectively disproven. So I think hopefully going forward, it will be less of an issue. Sure. OK. Um, and, and can I ask you uh, another question in terms of um, uh, sort of Brigada? I mean, a, we've had a question about how we treat people with regard. I mean, it's sort of slightly outside the scope of this uh, talk, uh, but perhaps you could just say a line or two about that. And the second question was more an observation. We found that people with cocaine use often have a Brigada-like pattern uh, when they present after a binge of cocaine. Does that mean the cocaine has unmasked a Brigada condition underlying it, or is it actually just the, the effect of the cocaine per se? Um, so to answer the, the second one first, uh, similarly to long QT, there are a number of drugs that are, are known to exacerbate Brugada syndrome, and cocaine is one of them. Um, whether those patients have, again, some underlying um, sensation towards Brugada-like 
ECG abnormalities, I don't know. But certainly cocaine has very significant effects on, on, long key, on, on, uh, on the heart. So I, I would be reluctant to diagnose somebody with Brugada syndrome who only ever had a Brugada ECG with uh, cocaine use. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a sodium channel blocker, of course, so it can cause a channelopathy in effect, like like uh, uh, in Brugada. Yeah. Um, and then in the, the first question in terms of the management of Brugada, so as I said, it's kind of maybe beyond the scope. In general, the key to uh, management is the risk assessment. So many patients with Brugada syndrome don't need any specific medical intervention. They should be avo advised to avoid those drugs which can exacerbate the condition. Um, we advise patient, patients to treat any high temperature aggressively because fever can be a precipitant for an abnormal ECG and, uh, and a, a cardiac event. For those who are moderate or high risk of uh, cardiac arrest, we may recommend a primary prevention ICD. But obviously that's a big question often in, in a patient in their 20s or 30s. And then finally, for, for those truly high risk patients, often who have a, an ICD and who've received appropriate therapy more than once, there is emerging evidence that catheter ablation, where you uh, essentially burn the epicardial surface of the RVOT, can uh, have a dramatic benefit. But that's a, a big procedure with significant risks. And so therefore, at this stage, unless the evidence improves, is reserved for the truly high-risk patients. Before we just move on to Joseph again, I just one last quick question. And this is from Dr. Kiran. What's your choice uh, in a pre-excited AFib? Would you like to do an unsynchronized or synchronized cardio version? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite. Uh, in a, so, in a pre-excited AFib, yeah. would you prefer to do an unsynchronized or a synchronized cardio version? Uh, I think the syn synchronized cardio version would be preferable. Um, but, I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's often a fairly emergency emergent situation, but uh, you want to avoid the risk of an R on T phenomenon, so synchronised, yeah.